So I will uh, talk about this, and it's going to be a mostly incoherent talk, uh, uh, just bringing up some themes uh, dear to my heart, which I encountered in my work on natural algorithms, and there'll be some geometry. Uh, so, <clears throat> in 1932, there's this English psychologist, Bartlett, who performed the following um, experiment. So, he drew an owl, like this, and then he gave it to one of his students, and he said, just look at it for two minutes, did, and then he just yanked the owl out, just hit the, the drawing from the student, and said to the student, I want you to redraw it from memory. So, and you can take as much time as you want. So he did this, and then he got the owl. Now, that student has just drawn the owl, and what he's going to do is go to his friend, an, another student, and ask him to do the same thing. So again, make sure we're all on the same page. He's going to show his own owl to his friend for two minutes, and then he will ask the friend to redraw it from memory. And then this will keep on iterating, OK? So these are the pictures from 1932. So this is what happened. So you have this, 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 and then you get a cat. And you always get a cat. And um, now the, int the most interesting thing about this picture is really here, whoopsie, uh, is really here because the tail changes direction. Just think about it. I mean, it, it, it means that the concept of a cat has been so internalized it no longer matters where, where the tail goes. It's totally part of that thing. So in 1932, they wanted to understand what, what's happening. And of course, they didn't have the tools to do that. They're psychologists. And they still don't have the tools to do that, so they don't have, they don't have a clue. But... Um, but more work has to be done on this. And so this is a form of what's called iterated learning. Uh, I don't know if this microphone does anything. Is it placebo or is it actually oh, OK? All right. uh, so there's a teacher who is going to teach something here, an owl, and then provide that uh, samples. So the, the learner will sample from that um, uh, owl, and, and, and then will come up with its own hypothesis of what they saw and draw it. And then a sample to the second learner, and this will go on forever. Okay. And um, now, okay. So modern psychologists; these are psycholinguists. Psycholinguist is a great term. It, these are not linguists that happen to be psychos. They are actually linguists that have a psychological angle, although the two are not incompatible. Uh, and um, so they're interested in languages, and they have a theory of languages that uh, I don't want to get too specific, but roughly speaking, think of a giant vector space of languages, and so your own language is a mixture uh, of some canonical proto-languages that capture all that matters about language. So uh, now you want somebody to teach you Chinese, so she, you know, she's going to teach you Chinese for, for six months. Equipped with your knowledge of Chinese, you are going to be teaching your friend Chinese for six months. Six months. Yeah, six months. It's a very, very smart, intense people. And then, equipped with that knowledge, you're going to be teaching Chinese. And let's say this takes place in the United States, just so there's one language, English, that everybody speaks, and then you're trying to learn Chinese. So, um, okay, so what will happen is that after a while, people will be teaching each other English. Uh, language, Chinese will have been entirely expunged from that process. Uh, okay, and uh, so now in this model of linguistics, the way it works is this, that everybody has a prior. So prior age is a distribution over these canonical languages. And so you draw a language from your own distribution over these canonical uh, languages. So it's a probabilistic mixture. And so when somebody teach, you know, tries to teach you uh, something, then you have your own prior, and then you have the likelihood that given a certain hypothesis that you draw on as a, as a candidate language, it will output some, some data when you sample from it. Uh, so then on the basis of the data here, you do some Bayesian uh, you know, inverse, and then you get 
you update your posterior and so on and so forth. Now, Kelly's and Griffiths show uh, that this is a form of Gibbs sampling, and so it will mix to the prior, which is another way of saying that if you start teaching Chinese like this, after a while, people will teach each other only the language that they already know, um, which is rephrasing the notion of mixing. So I, I got intrigued by this problem, and I'll tell you why later I was intrigued by it. Um, uh, but with a former student of mine, Chu Wang, we showed that actually if you just increase the session length a little bit, so maybe six months is the first, uh, the first teaching length of, of the session. Uh, and, but then the second person who's learned Chinese from a teacher, maybe now is going to be teaching for six months and a day. And then the next one, six months and two days. You understand you will increase, slightly increase the teaching time. And, and then we show that if you do that the right way, then it's sustainable. In other words, Chinese will be taught very faithfully forever. Uh, the number of learners could be infinite. It, there will never be more than epsilon loss. By just increasing the length, just ever so slightly, so you can formalize this, you can talk about epsilon delta sustainability, and the intuition is pretty clear for any, any learners, could be an infinite number of them, with very high probability, the variation between uh, Chinese and the language that you will draw from your own distribution, your posterior distribution, uh, will differ very, very little, okay? Uh, so that's what it means, and we show that if you increase the length, not to be six months fixed forever, but to be Something logarithmic in T, T is the time, is the number of steps. Um, the teeth teacher, or the teeth, I'm sorry, the teeth learner, rather. Uh, then, then this is sustainable forever, okay? Um, now, Kalish, Griffiths, and Lewandowski um, have pursued this work, and they've uh, performed experiments uh, on on human beings, well, I mean, they are students, I'm not sure that qualifies, but you know, in psychology, you always experiment on undergraduate students. These are the only considered living, you know, human species. And, uh, and so they tried to teach Berkeley students about a line going down. How do you teach them about a line going down? So you do this by sampling. So you don't give them a line, you, you show them a cloud of points that really look like a line going down. And, uh, you could even infer it's probably y equals minus x plus one or something like that, but it doesn't matter. You just want to teach them a line going down. Uh, and so you do the same thing we just did with the owl and all of that. And here's what you get. You get this, you get this, you get this, you get this, and then you get this. You can never teach them a line going down. It will always go to a line going up. And now this could be maybe just in the US, maybe in some more pessimistic countries, it's, it's, it's the opposite, uh, and this is not a, just a frivolous comment. It's not only a frivolous comment because the U.S. Is, has this particular feature, not shared in many other countries, where it does not have any sign around airports of planes going down. Now, in Russia, there are plenty of such signs. You can see them through Google, but in the U.S., somehow psychologically, when you run an airport, you never want to have a, a public sign that points to the wrong direction <laughs> for obvious reasons. So all the planes go up. These are airports where you can only take off, you can never land. And, um, but it's, uh, so I don't know if there's any connection, who knows? Um, so anyway, some people want to understand what's going on, and that's not me, because I'm not a psycholinguist, <laughs> and I'm only half of that. But, uh, so, uh, okay, final thing is uh, regression. Yeah, so this point's going down. So this is a, pr a problem of regression. I mean, I'm trying to teach you uh, regression in iterated fashion. I give you the cloud of points going down. I want you to regress this into a line, obviously, and blah, 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 blah. So, um, so we can do this in higher dimensions, show that if you have a prior of a certain ID of what a hyperplane ought to be, you know, points uh, drawn from this with noise, and then there's a teacher that, have a different, that has a different idea, a, a different idea about what that hyperplane ought to be, uh, and the likelihood is just sampling from your candidate hyperplane with, with noise. Um, 
So you have this line going down, you can teach it, and then we show that if you increase the uh, length of the session, again, uh, this will make the process sustainable forever, so you will faithfully teach your whatever hyper plan you have in mind. Okay, um, now here's the whole point, is that this goes against the grain of most probabilistic reasoning in computer science uh, because it's thinking out of equilibrium, uh, something physicists do, sometimes do, and biologists do more often, and computer science almost never do. Um, and so, uh, let me explain. And so this is the angle that I want to talk about. So when you have a Markov chain, which is a stirring uh, equilibrium, it always reaches stationary distribution, uh, or minus some technicality of no importance. Uh, so, uh, which means that after a while, the whole system runs with that energy from the outside, and you can no longer tell the direction of time. You can no longer tell whether it's going one way or the other. Uh, and um, now, if you want to have sustainability for iterated learning, remember uh, uh, these people, Griffiths and Kelish and so on, observed that this was deep sampling. So this, is, this was a Markov chain. And a Markov chain will always lead to this sort of thermal death. And so to avoid that, then you have to inject energy into the system. Okay, so in other words, it's, it's exactly the opposite of 50 years of research in computer science that ha asked the question, given a Markov chain, please, please show me that it mixes very fast. Here we want the opposite. We want, here's a Markov chain, what's the minimum amount of work I have to do to keep it from ever mixing? Okay, which I would argue is probably the single most important problem in biology, but maybe if we have time we can get, uh, get back to this. So this notion of natural algorithm, which I've been working on for a long time, uh, just to remind you, a classical algorithm looks like this, a natural algorithm uh, looks like this, so pretty much they look the same. So it's just, a natural algorithm is just a classical algorithm, but we didn't get to engineer it, nature did, or whatever your philosophy of you know, metaphysics is, that's, that thing did it. And um, so, um, again, from a, from a physics point of view, I mean, I, I spent two years speaking mostly to physicists, and so maybe I'm a little bit conditioned now, but, but it matters really to understand actually how the physics works is that a, a natural algorithm, or for that matter, any living organism, any living system, um, exchanges matter and energy with the outside, but it does it in a very particular way. It always will require free energy, so that's energy that you can absorb into work and perform work, and this what will happen. And in doing so, it will produce entropy, okay? In fact, some people have argued that living organisms, th that evolution is really the art of maximizing the production of your entropy. And in particular, this is achieved through irre irreversibility, which right there tells you exactly why Markov chain is exactly the wrong model. Uh, because, uh, I mean, of course, the, most irre the first irreversible process in life is reproduction, which is obviously uh, irreversible. But most of the evolutionary innovations that come, can be best explained from a physics point of view, a biophysics point of view, in terms of ir irreversibility. Now, from a computer scientist, this is very interesting, because this is really a different way of, of thinking. And so I, I wanted to explore this. Now, if you look at this, uh, as a hood, and you just lift the hood and see, you know, what's inside, then you of, often what you see is a graph, but a graph that's dynamic, it changes all the time, uh, and it often changes in endogenous ways, it has its own rhythm, its own dynamic, and, and, and the graph, which tells you what communicates with what, uh, changes. Uh, now, again, it exchanges, it, it receives information from the outside, uh, so, could be matter of free, or free energy, but it's, it could be just signals, uh, driving fields, or something that drives something, carbon sources, uh, environmental fluctuations, all of this that makes ev evolution possible is a requirement. And um, so I, um, I worked on this very simple uh, model, but well, it's not that simple. It's very simple to explain what it is, but not so simple to analyze. Uh, called influence systems, and uh, this is the full description. So, so here's what happens. So you have these nodes, they're called agents, and um, 
Uh, is, they're just a name. But the reason they're called agents is because they behave like agents. You see, they, for, I mean, first of all, each one has its own state. So if this was a cell, so for example, the state could be where it is currently in the sales cycle, or its growth, its whatever you want, that all the parameters that matters to describe that object. So they all have this, and then they interact with each other, and so each agent uh, picks its in edges. In edges means the other agents that will provide information to that, to that, organ, I mean, to that agent. Uh, so by this side, I mean that there is a process, there's an algorithm, uh, like the cell will get its receptors to get proteins through it, or signals, transduction, and all that will be determined by the environment, of course, by what's outside, but by the particular algorithm that the cell happens to have and which has evolved. And all these rules from the agents form the, the type. So of course, once you have this information, you update your new state, and you go like this forever. Uh, and, but, but here's the point. Each agent could be different. These, these do not have to, to have the same rules. I mean, this is very important in biology, in particular, that diversity is really part of what makes it, things are interesting. They're, they're just not all the same. Um, so it's such a broad, general mo uh, model, you can almost do model anything you want with this. Uh, so uh, a flock of birds and fish, this is a colony of bacteria, or this is just what happens inside the, inside the cell. And um, maybe yeah, I can model all this if you want. But before I go into this, I just want to have a quick digression on why, why fear. I'm sorry, how long is this talk? Can I like 15 minutes? Mm -hmm. 50, okay. All right, th thank you. Why theory? Everybody works on, on big data. Theory is gone. Mathematics is gone. We, we just have to look at numbers and, and they tell us what to do. They will just rule our lives. I think I'm wasting your time and my time. Um, so, but here's why I don't believe this for a second. And I mean, there are millions of reasons why this is a, a, an absurd proposition, but, uh, but, but here's a good one. I mean, suppose you are a Martian and you come to planet Earth to find out what it's all about, and then you see this. Uh, this is the RSA chip that many people have just to get into a, you know, a building or into your computer or something like that. And uh, now, now this is very much like a living organism, except it doesn't live very much, but it, it's a circuit. It's got all this thing going on. Now, suppose you're the Martian and you have supercomputers and all that, and you want to find out what it does. Okay, so you can put electrodes and just start measuring currents and do whatever you do. Just think of a neuroscientist. Whatever neuroscientists can do with your brain, you can do even more with that because this does not, cannot die because it's not alive. So that's the advantage of not being alive. You can never die. And so, uh, so you can play with this. Here's the point. The Martian will never figure out what it does, I claim, until it learns some basic number theory. Just think about it, okay? And this will not teach number theory. QED, all right? And um, so, so without some theory, you can look at this until you're blue in the face. You will never figure out, unless you know from us, little theorem, for example, you'll never understand what this does, um, except just tracking bits. Um, so, but that was just a digression. I, I wanna go back to the, um, so if you want to do some theory, then you have to have some, some tools, and I've been working mostly on this, on finding conceptual tools, not so much on, on answering question, what's the meaning of life, why we're here, okay, I don't know, but, uh, uh, but you know, like tools, like divide and conquer and plain sweep that Franco was mentioning, are there some paradigms that, that are kind of useful, will be useful in the future perhaps, or something like that. So one of them is semantic renormalization, I want to talk about quickly. Uh, renormalization is a very common term in physics, uh, but every field uses the, a, a variant of that concept, so you can call it dimension reduction, coarse graining. If you're a computer scientist, probably, uh, if you're a programming language person, abstraction is what you call it, but if you're otherwise a, a graph algorithms person, it's just hierarchical graph clustering. I mean, you can do all this. So, so, so don't fixate on the term renormalization, but semantic is important. Um, so let me, to, let me explain what I mean by this. Now there's been a lot of work on, on here's a graph, so the graph could be embedded in, in some space or not, 
but often it is embedded in some space and you want to cluster it. You want to find the communities of a, of a Google search or on the internet or something like that, on the web, or you, well, whatever you want to do, but there's, a, there's a, a large network and you want to cut it up into pieces that make sense. And there are gazillion ways of doing that depending on your application, if it's computer graphics, if it's biology, there's lots of ways of doing that. And they all have to do with some kind of distance measure that you define and that makes you happy. And um, that's syntactical clustering. That's not semantic clustering. Okay, so here's what I mean by semantic clustering. Now here's a graph. You don't get to see the graph because I didn't draw the edges. But if you are a player, um, a soccer player, and these are professionals, they, they actually know when they're on the field at any time who they're supposed to look at. They don't have to look at the entire thing. They can, you know, so, so you can imagine this directed graph that connects the players to what they're doing, okay? Now, given that graph, you can go find your clustering experts down the hall of your department and say, okay, how do you cluster it? And they'll give you all these fancy techniques. Oh, you should do a spectral clustering. That's the way to do it and so on and so forth. And then you go see a six-year-old kid, you know, at recess in a school, and you ask him how do you do it. And he'll do it the right way. And because there's only one way you can cluster this, it, it's like this. It's completely obvious. It has nothing to do with geometry. And by the way, it has nothing to do with the fact that the jerseys are red or white. They could all uh, you know, have the same jerseys, same shirts. The six-year-old kid will still know this is the only way you should cluster uh, this graph before the game starts. There are two teams, it's obvious. But the geometry might, might not tell you that. This is not the obvious way of separating uh, these sets. Maybe here would be a much more natural thing. Why is it that, well, because the kid knows about soccer. And if, if you just understand the game, even just a little bit, then you know exactly how this graph falls into clusters. And when you think about it, it's entirely semantic. It's totally based on the rules. Now, the geometry plays a role, don't get me wrong, but the geometry is totally filtered through the process, a semantic process of understanding why do we have this graph to begin with? Why am I looking at people? The players know that instinctively. The coach, the coach will, will do renormalization, you know, clustering on a constant basis. But the graph, I try not to destroy this institution, and so, and the graph changes all the time. That's the whole point. Okay. For example, when you are here, when if you're soccer, you know that you've got to mark the opponents, but not just any opponents, and so on. So again, the coach and the players and the fans, they pretty much know. In fact, the commentaries and newspaper the next day will say, well, this team lost because, well, they won't put it that way, but because their, their renormalization was wrong. You know, the guy was marking the wrong, you know, he should have been on this player, not that player, and so on and so forth. So, first of all, and this clustering is not path independent. So it's not even the case that give me the graph, I'll cluster it. No, 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 it's very important to know the past. Why? Because you cannot change the clustering too fast. A player is not every two seconds completely change his understanding of the game. The clustering will have some consistency and will evolve more or less smoothly at the time scale of the player's thinking. Okay, and so, so but on the other hand, any six-year-old kid said that's the only way to do it. The, the spectral clustering is completely irrelevant, okay, when you look at this. And these graphs is what happens in biology. Uh, it's not, it's different from, say, the stars or, you know, things like that, uh, which tend not to move too much. Uh, so, now, again, let's look at some examples where we might apply this sort of semantic clustering. So here's a Markov chain. So, so look at the physical system that, that, that's a closed system, which is what we don't want. So a closed system will, be, will become a Markov chain. Because if the system is closed, then the second law of thermodynamics kicks in. It's a Markov chain, and the whole thing uh, makes sense. So now, if you want to understand the dynamics, so you want to do dynamical system on that, then dy dynamics means to classify the orbits. I mean, that's the meaning of the, the entire field. Um, so OK. It turns out to be very easy. You can just get any textbook on Markov chains and tell you exactly what to do. You have this graph, and it'll tell you that this is the way you cluster the graph. I mean, even if you don't know anything about Markov chain, it doesn't matter. There's only one way of clustering 
a Markov chain like this, I just drew it. End of theory. There's nothing else to say. But it's semantically driven. It has nothing to do with the particular geometry of the graph. Okay? It has to do with dynamics of the Markov chain. Now, this is very boring. Uh, okay, so renormalization involves coarse graining, which means once you've done something like this mentally, you have to think that now this has become a super agent. So these three agents really now form a super agent of three. So now you have five super agents of two kinds. In Markov chain classifications, these clusters have different meaning, okay? And so they're treated differently. So one is yellow and one is green, blue. I don't know, some color close to that uh, spectrum. And so, but the hierarchy is all flat, okay? Because that, that's it. This is an, an entire renormalization. There's not, not, nothing else to do. Um, now, in open systems, those we're interested in, in natural algorithms or open systems, then it's a whole different uh, thing. Now, what you have is uh, dynamics of dynamic networks. Now, dynamic networks have been studied for 30 years, 40 years. I mean, the field of algorithms is full of work on dynamic, dynamic networks. The dynamics of network is a very popular subject, all the scale-free graphs, power law, blah, blah, all of that. Uh, you know, the, the small world phenomenon. This is all about the dynamics of networks. But there's a very little work on dynamics of dynamic networks, which is unfortunate because this is really what every living form uh, has, uh, shows. So um, what matters is really to have some kind of conceptual tool to track the flow of information across a network when the network changes all the time, okay? Uh, think about it. It's, um, you know, you're doing a random walk on this network of roads, but then the roads uh, break down, or maybe new roads are created while you're doing it. And the creation of the roads is due to your own walking, okay? Because this is what happens when, you, when there's too much traffic on a road, then the road breaks down. And because there's too much traffic on the road, people build other roads. So there's this feedback loop, and this is what you need to understand. Now these things give rise to deep renormalization hierarchy. So again, I'll, without going into any details, I'll just uh, tell you what, uh, just a little cartoon to explain what I have in mind. Um, so think of an infinite sequence of graphs, okay? And they all have the same number of nodes. So you have a fixed number of agents, and then you have an infinite, an infinite number of graphs. Typically these graphs are embedded in some space, but they don't even have to, but typically they are. And, um, and you want to understand what, and information flows. Just think of these agents as passing messages to the neighbors constantly. And well, let, let, let's just pick one you know, small example. Suppose that this agent knows a tune, knows the Italian anthem, okay? And nobody else knows it. Now, this guy is going to be singing the Italian anthem. And those that point to him will get to hear it. So they will learn the anthem, okay? And so on and so forth. Now the question is, will everybody learn the Italian anthem at some point? Now if the graph was fixed, well, this is like algorithms 101, okay? It, it just depends, uh, uh, you know, whether uh, the graph is strongly connected or not, or, or not, if not strongly connected. I mean, you've seen all this, you know, there should be a path for maybe. But when the graph changes all the time, there's no such thing. There's, there's, the strongly connected means nothing, actually. You, you, there's no such notion. Uh, and yet, this is a well-defined concept. I want to know if within six months, magic six months, everybody will know the Italian anthem, yes or no? In biology, these are the kind of systems that arise all the time. Um, so, um, so, here's what we're gonna do. We're going to interpret this, this entire thing, as a sentence in a formal language. So in this language, the letters, the alphabet, if you will, consists of letters, and each letter will be a graph. Okay, so there's a finite number of them, because there's a finite number of graphs. And so these are the letters. And then I'll give you a grammar, 
and the grammar will allow you to form these sentences that are valid sentences. And given that, then we'll be able to parse it. Okay, we'll be able to parse it the way you parse a programming language, you know, program or something like that. Uh, and, and from this, we will build the renormalization, so it will respect time. So over time, you can read this thing. And as you go up, you get to see the coarse graining of these. It's not that easy to visualize, actually, because hierarchical clustering, you know, you use three dimensions to usually think about it. You know, you, you think of a sort of, you start with these blobs, and the blobs get, you know, and so on. But now think of this as moving over time, so the blobs get rearranged, and, and the parsing takes place uh, like this. Now, why are we doing this? Because this is extremely useful, okay? So, you know, then you can show that, say, under some conditions, almost all orbits uh, have uh, limit cycles. So essentially, the system is almost always periodic, and which kind of matters. Now, you can also show some other things that are very critical, in my view, to biology, um, which is mixed time scales and archival mechanism. I think one of the most intriguing aspects of biology is the emergence of memory. Now, the time ratios are absolutely uh, staggering. I mean, you know, look at your own body and look at the smallest cycle you have and the biggest cycle you have. The time scales are just off by absolutely, you know, by gazillions. This is really astonishing. How, how does this work? I mean, how does your body know? Uh, that you have to have, you know, even circadian cycle. I mean, we understand the proteins involved in circadian cycle. We, we do all this. Do we understand why this actually works? No, we don't. But absolutely not a clue. And um, to me, these are really very Im important questions. And uh, maybe a uh, little time I have left, I'll uh, look back at some of the work that I did. I, I got started in natural algorithms by birds, and so I've always had uh, certain affinity for flocks of birds, and then I give up because I thought it was way too difficult, so I'll do something easier. Uh, and, but what I learned from the work on birds, so there's a certain flocking model where these birds are flying, happy, and each bird looks within the radius of R, uh, and then they average their velocity. So they'll fly at some velocity, and this guy will just look at these friends and just take the average velocity and continue flying and just do that. And, um, so anyway, and so what you can show is that where the birds will fly and it'll be a big mess, and, but after a while, they'll start merging into flocks, I guess, and then finally the flocks will reach steady state and that'll be the end, okay? Um, now this is interesting because you can show that the worst case convergence time is a tire of two of height log, the number of birds. This is a very strange function, it's not very common. And, um, but this is optimal, actually, this system, the the, the, the smell Vishak model, actually, this is the this is the function. It's like the busy beaver function of that computer. And uh, now, of course, no living system has this function doing anything. This is obvious. But that's not the right question. The right question is, why do we get these big time scales? What happens? How come this system, which you can model as a natural algorithm, so the way I've uh, talked about, how come it produces these, uh, you see, like Markov chains have only two time scales, polynomial, exponential, and that's it. There's nothing else, okay? Uh, so to some extent, they have no time, okay? The, the, you, the, there's no time quantity you can extract for a Markov chain, basically. But natural algorithms, when you have these open systems, now you can start really having all these different time scales that interact. And uh, which is, by the way, what really distinguishes biology from physics and chemistry in my view, the most, are time scales. Okay, biology is really the part of physics where time scales are inseparable. You know, in any other kind of physics, pretty much the first thing you do is separate time scales so you can simply work on one particular uh, range. And you cannot do that in biology. And um, so we need uh, tools for that. Uh, let me just skip all this. So, but just to see some nice geometry. I uh, hope you appreciate it. Yeah, so I'll tell you how long it took me to draw that picture. Um, so, so I decided to work on something easier, and I, there are these uh, German uh, social scientists uh, who had introduced the system named after them, 
And it's, it's a very neat system. I thought this is like flocking, but easier, so maybe you should do something now. So everybody has, is somewhere on the political spectrum. So here in two dimensions, you're right wing, left wing, libertarian, authoritarian, you're somewhere. And then you speak and you listen to maybe to listen to everybody, but you're only influenced by people who are kind of like you. Okay? So you can listen to a crazy guy all day, has no influence on your opinion. But if you listen to a good friend and there's some differences of opinion, then you pay attention and maybe you adjust your opinion a little bit. So all these agents have a certain circle of influence and they listen to their friends over here and then they maybe move to the center of gravity or some weighted center, mass center of their neighbors and they all do that. And um, so you draw a pretty picture. You see there's nice symmetry breaking. It's like with the Poisson process. It's a uniform distribution and then, and then you have these little two-dimensional structure that appears and, and so on. It's almost like Voronoi diagrams. And uh, now, so you can formalize this in one dimension. It's, you just have a given an agent I. The neighbors are defined by all the agents J at distance R. So this is on the line. And then everybody moves to the average of their neighbors. So this guy I will move to the average of itself and this one and this one. And that's it. They all do that forever. Um, so this is known to converge and we have bounds on, on this. And so this is fairly well understood. Uh, but there was a, uh, I worked uh, with a student on uh, famous conjecture uh, that said that um, when you start from a random initial configuration, so here, this is random. So between say, zero and 10, then you spread you spread tons of agents over here, okay? And then this is time, and you have these dynamics. And what happens is they, they all cluster into these things, and there's a separation of roughly 2R, and the 2R conjecture states that um, with high probability or on average or, or what have you, the separation will be 2R, okay? And there'll be lots of simulation. It, it's a very strange conjecture, because, well, first of all, it's obviously false. Because when you actually run the simulation, you, you find it's 2.3R. But on the other hand, I mean, of course they knew that. But they, they figure, you know, 2.3 is very close to 2. And, and 2 is a nicer number than 2.3. So, so maybe it's OK to call your conjecture 2R, when in fact it's 2.3R. Um, but. Uh, but the worst is nobody knew how to prove this thing, and we still don't know how to prove it. So, well, you can quickly realize that one of the problems are the pathologies. When the agents really, you know, even though it's random, random could mean strange things. They, they could start in, in, in a very close to, to sort of critical uh, configuration. So you don't like this, and so you do something that's very common in physics, which means you introduce a little bit of random uh, Brownian motion. Okay, so you can set up a stochastic uh, um, differential equation where the agents do their averaging over here. But then there's a little, little Brownian process that goes with the noise uh, sigma. And then you can draw these uh, phase diagrams between the noise and R, which is the length of this averaging. You know, you're looking R, R on both sides and you average yourself. And you see, a phase transition, which is interesting, between order, uh, between sort of something where you would have clustering, uh, and when you increase sigma, the noise, then you have something that becomes flat, which is a uniform. So the diffusion wins. So it's a battle between diffusion, which is, you know, sort of dissipative process, and then there's this contracting, you know, there's a contractive process. We try to average, averaging process uh, is something that will, you know, uh, contract if you know, all the eigenvalues are strictly less than one. Um, so, so here's what we did. We actually looked at the thermodynamic limit, which is when you take the number of agents and you bring n to infinity, which to some extent is what we do as in asymptotic uh, analysis of algorithms. Uh, and, um, and so we end up with an equation that's a variant, a very uh, 
well-studied family of equations in physics called Fokker-Planck. Uh, and we use a formulation by these three uh, people uh, who studied also the similar dynamics. And so, okay, we showed that actually this was well-posed, which interestingly was not known. And well-posed means that the differential equation has a solution. It's unique, and it's a good solution. It's smooth, regular, it's all kinds of nice things. Um, and then we proved that there's a number 2.29. It's not the exact number, but it's a, it's, a, it's a transcendental number, but it's close to 2. Point, so very close to 2.3. Uh, and so to do this, it's more like standard, or I don't know if it's standard, but differential equations. You do a separation of variables uh, between the modes of, so you basically take these Fourier modes and you try to look at the, the, the right k, the k that will determine the cluster. The separation between clusters would correspond to a given mode and you're sort of looking for that. And um, so you end up with an expression like this and you say gamma equals zero and then you take the derivative of that thing and the point at which is zero gives you x and s is related to to that mode, k, so that gives you the mode k, and then it gives you the intercluster distance to pi r over s. And that's how we get this. But it just goes to show how much easier differential equations are, you know, are than, than, than the real. I mean, discrete is infinitely more difficult, okay? I mean, everything you can do uh, in differential equations, you can do with discrete. The other, the other way around is absolutely not true. Uh, and so, so to some extent, I mean, it's not that surprising. We could solve the 2R conjecture, the 2.3R conjecture in the, third, in the thermodynamic limit, but we still have not any clue how to do it in the discrete case when you have N, N objects. Okay, uh, let's see. I have like two minutes left or something like this. Yeah, five minutes. Uh, okay, so, you know, I just put lots of slides in here. Maybe I'll just skip that because you're all very tired. It's been a, a long day. No, it hasn't been a long day. <laughs> it's a nice thing to say. It's been a very long day. And uh, what for me, I, because uh, I just flew in. I'm a little bit jet lagged. Maybe you've noticed. Um, and um, okay. Yeah, let me just actually, okay. I don't know if, how much what I said made much sense to you, but I want to make a larger point which I think is, uh, I, I think the field of natural algorithms raises all kinds of philosophical questions. And, and the first one is from a computer scientist's point of view, is what role do computer scientists, is there any particular angle? I'm not even saying results. Is there any results computer science has that could be brought to bear? The answer is no, so forget about that. That's the wrong question. The right question is, fields bring their own culture and perspective, a, a particular perspective. The certain perspective way of looking at things. And uh, is there anything particular about the perspective of computer science, in particular of algorithms, that could be of use in biology, which is really ultimately what I'm interested in? And my hope is yes. Okay, God, I, this is unprovable, obviously, but, um, but my hope is yes, and, and maybe this thing tries to illustrate what's going on. Uh, why is biology so difficult? And um, well, there's a standard answers. Well, there's history. It's the only truly historical science in the natural sciences because evolution sort of records all these past events, which, which the rest of physics doesn't, literally doesn't. Okay, you want to study the planets, just look at them right now. You know, each planet has momentum and position, pretty much all you need to know equations will do the rest. This is remarkable. You don't have to know the past of the solar system. It's irrelevant. That's not true in biology. And so we don't know how much we should know or not know. You know, all these variables, which one are important, you know, which, which one are not. Um, but I think that, why is it physics were, was able to do that? I mean, after all, even mechanics, you know, involves trillions and trillions of small bodies interacting, you know, the molecules, the atoms, and so on. So it's very complicated. You cannot solve Schrodinger's equation every time you 
you drop a ball to see how fast it goes. There are macroscopic laws that somehow bypass all this. So the, the, there must be some, some cancellation. There must be some simplifications. All these Avogadro number of tiny objects doing their own thing obviously must be coming to some kind of consensus so that we can observe this and make sense of it without having to look down at each of the molecules in position and where they are. So this is the miracle of universality. Uh, you know that, I mean, you see this in the law of large numbers, maybe that's the best example. You know, if you have, if you add an immensely large collection of variables, random variables that are independent or mostly independent, then it doesn't matter what they are, as long as you know their means and their standard deviation, that's it. There's a law that says, I know what will happen to the sum. In fact, the bigger the better. So is the n body problem in reverse. The bigger n is, the more accurate your estimate will be. So this is universality. It means that at the level of the observable, the particular details don't matter. I mean, this is like the, like the icing model have been so so successful is because they're independent of the particular lattice arrangement in which you uh, perform your calculations. Because we know these are not what nature does, actually, but the principle says it doesn't matter. At the very low dimensional level, so this would be like um, some part of algorithms, uh, but also, you know, calculus used in dynam for dynamical systems. Um, I mean, dynamical systems um, theory has, is a beautiful, beautiful field and has, there's one historical weakness, uh, which is not due to anybody, it's just the course of history, which is that the problem originated from the solar system, from studying the planets. And here's the thing, there are not many planets, there are very few planets. And in, in, um, in, in dynamical systems, Virtually all the interesting phenomena occur in low dimensions. You don't have to go to very high dimensions to start seeing remarkable things. In, in very, very low dimensions, much less than 10, everything that's worth knowing, I mean, it's not quite right, I mean, but that's the way the focus of the field has been. Biology is not like that. Biology falls in the middle. It's not big enough that you can use the laws of universality that you find in equilibrium statistical mechanics, for example, very, very powerful. Um, on the other hand, it's too big. It's too big, you know, so like flocks could be 10,000 birds. It's too big and too small. The, the, this, these numbers are exactly the worst numbers. And, um, and somehow, I think that that's, that's really what we're trying to come to terms with which is when you have small numbers but not too small and you have diversity, then somehow our standard analytical tools you know, seem to break down. And so in that sense, to some extent, I think that given the role of time, the role of time plays in these systems, which they do not, say for Markov chains, then I think this is what computer science is, out the field of algorithms is called upon to play a big role because algorithms, is, is equations plus memory, okay? I mean, what distinguishes algorithms from the rest of mathematics is the role of time, but not just time, not just time, but memory, okay? That's what makes algorithms uh, powerful. And biology, the real miracle of biology, I believe, is the role of time and memory. That, that um, sort of innovation, the constant innovation for evolution. So I will, I think, stop here. Uh, hopefully I'm not too much, not too much, thank you. <laughs>